Yeah, got it. Hey everybody, and welcome once again to The Birders Show. Uh, please, as ever, do remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for all the latest updates. And if you want to support our mission of making birding more accessible to everyone around the world, please do check out the link below for our Patreon account, where you can support and help us keep creating this content, keep traveling, keep birding. And speaking of birding, I'm joined, as always, from his base in Medellin, Colombia, by my co-host Diego Calderon. Diego, nice to see you again. Cruz May, how's it going? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Sunny day here. Took a little stroll this morning around the city, did a little bit of uh, urban birding, inspired well, inspired by David Lindo. I, I took on a bit of urban birding this morning. I actually found a sparkling violet ear nest about 10 blocks from my house, really close in a little abandoned garden right next to uh, right next to Parkway. You know the park running through Bogota. Was the, was the situation there uh, eggs, chicks, or you couldn't, you couldn't check today? I couldn't really get an angle to see what was in it, but the, the adult was sitting on the nest when I found it. So whether incubating or babies or whatever, but I'm going to have to go back and have a better look because I had to rush to the studio to hang out with you to film this episode. So I didn't have time. That's so Bogotanian, you know, like sparkling or, or, or lesser violet or nesting like in parks and in the cities and people even non-birders just seeing them and taking photos and stuff. I love that. That's pretty, pretty, pretty capital Bogota stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think the sparkling violet here, the copeton and the great thrush are kind of our, our trio of of city birds. Your national birds. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of national Bogota birds. Um, what about you? Have you been up to anything interesting recently, bird-wise? Oh, yeah, man. You know, I've been, been traveling a bit. Actually, one of the, my, my few last outings was in the Central Andes. Uh, we were on a farm trip with several friends, uh, having, you know, like visiting places in, in, in around Manizales and Pereira area, getting amazing birding and stuff. Uh, we were just, you know, having fun for a week. It wasn't work. It was just, you know... Just, just for the sake of, of going birding. And actually, it's, it's pretty neat because being on that trip, that was, you know, a few, few weeks ago, I was able and super, you know, privileged and fortunate to meet actually with our two guests today. So, you know, like we, we I mean, let, you, you can do the introduction, the proper introduction to our people today. But, you know, it was absolutely a cool coincidence and connection seeing these guys, you know, a few weeks ago and now having them on the birder show here. Well, actually, I think that I also briefly met up with our two guests today, not long before you did in Bogota. We had dinner together. So actually, yeah, well, I might as well bring them in at this point. So today's guests on The Birder Show are Eliana and Mark Kramer, also known as Birding by Bus. Uh, they're joining us from... Where are you joining us from, guys? Hello, by the way. Welcome to The Birder Show. Hey, Chris. Hey, Diego. Yeah, we're, um, we're joining you from Miami, Florida. Uh, this is our home, although we're rarely here these days. We've been on the road quite a bit. Yeah, I've been following you on social media. You've been all over the place, right? You just came back from Portugal? Yeah, we just returned from Portugal just a few days ago. And uh, this is a rare sighting that you actually have us in Miami because uh, we're always on the move. Mark is actually packing his bags today and head out to Alaska tomorrow. So yeah, we are always on the go, go, go. But I'm so happy to see you guys here. Well, we're, yeah, we're delighted to have you. You guys are in the same house right now, isn't it? Like, you, you're okay. There's no fighting or something going on. You're in different rooms. <laughs> <laughs> different rooms for this episode. No fighting. We're burning my bus. We're good. Uh, and <laughs> yes. And, uh, but anyways, I was so happy that I, we got to see both of you in Colombia last month. So that was really exciting. Uh, and talk about the Birders show. <laughs> It was great to see you guys. Absolutely great to see you after having, you know, met like, you know, probably a few months earlier in the Indiana Dunes Birding Festival in the States. Oh, right. Yeah. We've seen you twice this year. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Wow. Not bad. Not too shabby. Good <laughs> stuff. I know. I'm feeling a, bit, feeling a bit left out now. You guys have been all birding all around the world together and we, we only had time for a quick dinner. But next time, next time we'll hang out and we'll go birding. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. <laughs> well, to, to just bring it back to the episode today, for the people who aren't familiar who are watching at home. So Elian and Mark, uh, as we already mentioned, are birding by bus. Uh, and in 2018, uh, they left their jobs to embark on a 25,000 mile well, road trip across the United States in Valentina, right? The, the VW bus is called Valentina, uh, from Florida to Alaska. And according to what I'm seeing here, um, you married, you got married in Alaska during that year. You honeymooned on Atu. So quite a year. I mean, it's probably an 
obvious opening conversation, but um, what what was the inspiration to to undertake that journey? Because that's quite an epic thing to do. Sure. <laughs> the, uh... Yeah, so 2018 was absolutely amazing. And yes, uh, the name of the Volkswagen bus, she is from 1978. Her name is Valentina. And the reason why she got her name is because when we bought her back in 2008, we bought her on Valentine's Day. So, of course, mm. she had to have the Valentina name. But yeah, in 2017, uh, we got engaged in Alaska. And Alaska is like one of our favorite places in North America. And uh, when we got engaged, we came back to Miami and it was time to start planning the wedding. And Mark's dad, he's like the nicest guy. He's like, Eliana, let's start working on, on planning the wedding. Let's work on the guest list. Well, in just a few minutes, that guest list had 72 people. So <laughs> let's say that that didn't really go well with me. And the first few nights I was like tossing and turning and just thinking too much and just it just it wasn't feeling right so i go up to mark and i say mark listen what if instead of this big expensive wedding we get in valentina we drive from miami to alaska get married married in alaska just the two of us and and you make this this trip of a lifetime and believe it or not mark actually loved that idea and he loved it so much that he threw in a twist that we will not only do or traveling through Valentina for the entire year, but also that uh, we will go to Atu for our honeymoon and the bus and do our own version of a birding big year. So try to see as many species as possible in North America for that one year. And it was going to be very unique because most people that do a big year are like traveling from one place to the other in a plane. They're going very, very fast pace. And for us, we were traveling in the slowest vehicle possible that likes to break down a lot. <laughs> so, so yeah, but we did that in 2018. We drove all the way to Alaska, got married at a place called Bird Point in Alaska, and went all the way to Atu for our honeymoon, which it was an interesting story to say the least. <laughs> and Mark has to take that one. <laughs> Isn't there a scene in the movie The Big Year where there's a joke about a couple having their honeymoon on Atu and the main character kind of raises his eyebrows like, honeymoon on Atu? Here you have them. Yeah. That's got, you're, the real, you're the real people. We actually filled that role, kind of relived that scene of The Big Year where we uh, we actually did the honeymoon a little before the wedding. Um, yeah, and, and actually the whole year really was a bit of a, a extended honeymoon. I mean, we were on the road for uh, 10 months um, it took about two months of preparations and then 10 months on the road. And I consider the whole year the honeymoon. But, uh, <laughs> but, but the Atu trip, was, the Atu trip was, was special and was definitely a, a bucket list trip that we had been dreaming of for, for a long time. And actually, I think the big year movie um, really inspired us to, to, to seek out that journey to Atu. Yeah, absolutely. I'd never even, to be honest, I'd never even heard of Atu until I watched that movie. It's a kind of a bizarre, I mean, what's the situation with Atu? For those who are watching who don't really know what the deal is with Atu, can you can you shed some light on that? Sure. So Atu is the, the westernmost island in the Aleutian Island chain of, of Alaska. You know, that sort of chain of islands that comes off the southwestern portion of Alaska and sort of extends its way across the Bering Sea to Russia. Um Atu is is actually closer to Russia than it is mainland Alaska. It's 1,100 miles from mainland Alaska, and it's it's very remote. Um, it used to be a U.S. military base. Uh, I believe it was a Coast Guard station. Um, but uh, after sort of Cold War Russia era um, things started to quiet down, the U.S. decided to abandon their military presence there, and so the entire island was abandoned in about the year 2000. And actually very quick there, you know, Mark, what's the importance of Atu for birders on the ABA craziness? Sure, so yeah, the, the appeal of, of Atu to North American birders, it's, it's, it's a vagrant hotspot. Its position um, in, in close proximity, proximity to Asia means that a lot of Asian birds during uh, spring and fall migration 
um, that get, get lost or disoriented or wander a bit far off their normal migration flyways, they often um, land on Attu, which is, you know, kind of a resting spot for birds that have been blown off course. So uh, North American birders really want to see birds from Asia, and Attu is probably the best place to find those Asian vagrants. Which makes them t- tickable for the North American list, right? Yeah, birds, birds tickable. You know, if you're into into listing and and you know, sort of padding your North American list, um, Attu is is the place to go. Now we we went there. You know, we're not really big um, listers or, or twitchers. We really just sort of wanted to have this bucket list adventure to a place where very few people have ever ventured. We've been going to Alaska um, for probably the last. 15, 20 years. It's one of our favorite places on earth. And we just really wanted to see Atu and have that experience. So we, of course, did get to see a lot of those Asian vagrants. We actually had one day, um, our best day on Atu. I think we we saw 15 different Asian vagrant species in a single Crazy. day, which was <laughs> great. We had a gray streak flycatcher, uh, redneck stint, three species of wagtail, uh, black-tailed godwit, um, lots of great Asian Asian birds, and uh, that was definitely a, a day to remember. Probably the best birding day of our entire year. Well, actually, it's funny you say that because I was about to ask what your sort of top birding memories of the trip were. You sort of you answered it with that one, but Eliana, like on your end, what uh, what memories, what birding memories, and 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 lifers stand out from that year? Yeah, so um, I'm just listening to Mark t- tell the story about Atu and. <laughs> he didn't really go into details on how to really get to Atu and what happened to us getting to Atu and all the stories on getting out of Atu because a lot of things happened during this. And to me, Atu is like a blurred moment because I was so seasick. Getting, I mean, going there, it took us five days approximately to get to Atu. And yeah, I should, I, I should have explained that to, to get to Atu, um, you can't fly there anymore. The, the the runways and all the landing instrumentation, you know, everything's abandoned. So uh, the furthest west you can fly in the Aleutian Island chain is an island called Adak. And then from Adak, you need to board a, a boat. Um, we went with a, a small, small tour company um, with about nine birders. And um, that boat ride is a 450 mile boat ride from the island of Adak to the island of Attu in very, very rough seas, you know, real difficult Bering Sea, ocean swells. And um, and if you've ever been on a boat with Eliana, you might know that she's <laughs> the most seasick prone. Yeah, she she does not do well on boats. Oh, on, a, on a flat, calm lake on a boat, she would be seasick. So you can imagine, you know, traveling on a boat in the Bering Sea to Attu, she was, um, she was, pretty much passed out the entire uh, boat ride, um, <laughs> which was five days there, three days on the way back. And um, while we were doing our actual birding on Attu, um, the boat was where we slept because there's no place on the island to um, to sleep. Um, and it's kind of rough, you know, camping. So we lived on the boat. And I think every night she probably got a little bit seasick too. So those short moments on land were a huge relief for her. I, I've kind of blocked out some of those... Uh, <laughs> traumatic moments but i know that was you know that was oh, a man. yeah a rough a rough time for her and i i think i promised her after that trip that i would never take her on a boat ever again yeah actually <laughs> on the wedding vow so we went to add to the end of may beginning of june and then we got married on june 24th so like mark mentioned we went to add to before the wedding so a honeymoon before the wedding and I made Mark promise me and, and the wedding vows that he will never put me on another boat ever again. That was that was in the wedding vows. <laughs> in the wedding <laughs> vows, because I was nice. so, so sick. Uh, but you know what? I don't regret going to Atu. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I regret it at the moment. But looking back now, it was such an experience to make it all the way there. Alaska is such a special place for us. And just being able to say that we went there, you know, and then for me, one of the things that I really loved about Atu was not just the birds, but also the history behind Atu and all the things that happened there with World War II and and being able to do photography and document that. I really enjoy that. I don't know how I had the energy once I got off the boat after not eating for five days to actually do any birding and photography, but I did. 
And uh, one of my favorite pictures that I have from Atu is the second that I got on, on Atu and touched land, I took the Colombian flag. So for those of you that don't know, I'm Colombian. As you always, as you always do. As I always do, because the Colombian flag goes everywhere with me. I'm actually looking at it right now. And uh, yes, yeah, so I took out the flag and I have this picture with the flag and it just, I always wonder if I'm like the first Colombian to ever touch, uh, you know, land on, on Atu. And uh, it was very special to me and I, I'm glad we made it there. But yeah, everybody that found out that we were going to Atu for our honeymoon, were wondering what on earth were you guys thinking? <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad we did it. And uh, the most special bird that I saw that year was actually in, uh, during that trip uh, and the Tarek Sandpiper. And uh, it's Tarek Sandpiper from Asia. And uh, it was a vagrant that we got to see during this vo voyage to Atu. And it was a very, very special bird. And that year in 2018, um, I usually avoid shorebirds because shorebirds is a group of birds that are very difficult to ID, especially during like winter plumage. Yes, you see, I'm not the camp. only one. Okay, good. Yeah, my cab. Okay. It's a Colombian thing. <laughs> yeah, shorebirds are my favorite, so. Well, Mark loves shorebirds too. Like Mark has a thing for shorebirds and like they're, they're super cool and I love them and everything. But I mean, I always but. like, okay, like, but like I always like avoided them and I'm like, oh man, we're going to go shorebird looking uh, right now. So, but anyways, that year, like uh, one of the special moments that I had during the year was seeing this Tarek Sandpiper and also in Alaska, uh, there's a huge migration of shorebirds arriving to Alaska for, um, for the summer for breeding and we were in this place called Cordova, Alaska and there was a really bad storm the day before which brought the birds down and there's something to be said when you are put in the middle of an avian aurora and there were like 50,000 plus shorebirds from sandpipers to plovers, yellow legs, you named it. They were there and that moment really made me fall in love with them and now I give them a chance. <laughs> They're still very hard, but I have Mark to help me ID them because he is the expert of shorebirds. <laughs> that, that's definitely my favorite family of birds. I love the challenges. I love the you know ever changing uh, plumage and uh, you know the, the the vast migrations and uh, I just find that that group fascinating. So yeah, we we're working together now, and now that she <laughs> appreciates them a little more, I can uh, you know can spend more time looking at looking birds through scopes on the beach. Diego, I will I will convert you to shorebirds. Yet there's hope. <laughs> there's hope. Man, like propose me propose me honeymoon in Alaska, Chris, and I'll be on it. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> we have to make a commitment that the four of us are going to Alaska together during the summer and watching all these amazing shorebirds that have made this super long trip to make it up there. So it's a deal. We, it's being recorded right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're going to convert me in the trip. We're in. Perfecto. We, <laughs> so I wanted to ask you guys, going back, because we've, we've kind of discussed your, your adventures, your honeymoon, your marriage, all that stuff. But going back even before that, how, how did you guys meet? What's your story with birding? Were you both birders separately or did one of you convert the other? How, how did that happen? Um, yeah, so um, I think I, I, you know, I'm, I'm the original birder here. I've been birding since the early 90s when I was a college student at uh, Cornell University. And you can imagine as a Cornell student, I was kind of sucked into the lab of ornithology and, um, you know, was uh, in a biology <laughs> and animal behavior program. And so that that is sort of my roots in birding. Um, Eliana and I met in 2006. And um, I think on one of our very first dates, I introduced her to what a, uh, a northern cardinal was. I was trying to explain to her the difference between a male and a female cardinal and, you know, how to tell them apart. And Eliana had, she definitely had a, um, a, a background interest in nature and animals. She had actually worked in the veterinary field and done a lot of animal rescue and also growing up, and maybe she can elaborate a little bit more on this. She, um, when she was in Colombia, she had a, had a great appreciation for, for nature and, and wildlife, although I don't think she was ever, you know, really focused on birds. Um, but, uh, you know, as we uh, continued our relationship, I kind of remember a few months into the relationship, we did a big uh, canoe trip out of the Florida Everglades. We got stuck at low tide on a mud flat and here we are surrounded by a number of different wading birds. We had uh, 
great egrets, snowy egrets, white ibis, little blue herons, um, wood storks, and all these <laughs> birds are white wading birds. They all, you know, sort of to someone who's not a birder, they all look exactly the same. Um, Eliana said, oh my God, you know, how am I ever going to tell the difference between all these birds? They all, they're all white. And I'm like, you know, here, you know, here's, here's what this one looks like. And here's the difference with this one. And, you know, I think sort of little by little as our relationship grew and as she was exposed to more and more birds through our activities, we did a lot of outdoor um, nature related activities. Um, it took a few years, but I think probably two or three years into our relationship, she definitely caught the caught the bird bug and um after that she was she was hooked and guess who has seen more species of birds in the world i always have to bring this up <laughs> <laughs> you read my mind actually you read my mind because i was going to say my next question was going to be even though mark you introduced eliana to birds she often proudly states that she has the bigger life list i was going to ask how how has that happened Where, where's the discrepancy coming from I think we're only apart by like 30 species now. So Mark had not birded in Portugal and I had been to Portugal before and I also have birded in Israel. So there was an overlap there. And now that we took him to Portugal during our Birding My Bus tour, he got a lot, of, a lot of lifers. So now I'm getting into trouble because he's, 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 he's getting too close to me. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's got a couple of Columbia trips on me too. She's done a couple of solo okay. Northern Columbia and a couple of other areas of Columbia. So I need to, I need to hit some of those. We, we, we can give you a hand with that. Like let's le leave Eliana a home and yeah. I need to do a trip with you guys and you know, Eliana yeah. can go Visit off family, and... visit family in Bucaramanga. No, no, no. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Actually, yeah, exactly. Diego, yeah, do you remember the, the WhatsApp message I sent you recently? I'm like, Diego, I, what birds of this can I can I get? Uh, if I make yeah, a yeah. trip, what areas of Colombia do I need to target? So I'm, get, I'm getting competitive. You're trying here. to go higher. Yeah. For <laughs> Colombia, I have 800 species approximately, and I want to get at least to 1,200. So I, I need to like hit some areas, and I'm... You know, like I need to, I need my, I need my friends to help me out and tell me where can I go and you know, but so I'm scheming things. I'm scheming things. <laughs> but you're originally from Santander, right? Do you have the Santander endemics? Do you have the, uh, the hummingbird, the wren? I actually have done very little birding in Santander. So I actually do need to make it to Santander. It seems like every time I go to Bucaramanga, uh, you know, like the family is so big and you have to go visit the abuelita and the tia and, and all the family members. And uh, yeah, so I, there's very little time for birding. But I now that I have a goal of seeing 1200 species uh, for Colombia, uh, I need to start targeting certain areas and Santander is one of those. So road trip time. <laughs> that's a good that's a good that's a good neighborhood to nail down some endemics and some good some goodies in Colombia. Now that I'm, that I'm going to Colombia a lot more, now we're, we're taking like three to four tours to Colombia a year. Uh, and I just really want to show the world how amazing Colombia is in so many different ways. So I want to explore Colombia myself because I feel like by me knowing my country better, I can show that to the world better. Absolutely, yeah. And well, one thing we can certainly say is you don't lack enthusiasm for birding in Colombia. As you said, you've got the Colombia flag with you wherever you go, kind of <laughs> representing that around the world. But Mark, I wanted to ask you, did you have any, I mean, probably as a birdie, you were familiar with Colombia being a top birding destination, but did you kind of explore Colombia through Eliana or had you had any experience birding around this area before you met? Um, so I actually um, had never been to Colombia, but I had spent quite a bit of time in uh, Panama and Costa Rica before Eliana and I met. Um, in the mid nineties, I worked with a Cornell professor in uh, in Panama in the uh, canal zone out of Gamboa, um, which is now really well known for the uh, the Canopy Tower. Um, I was actually there before the Canopy Tower was the Canopy Tower. It was just a U.S. military installation. And I was there studying wattle jacanas on the Chagres River, looking at the polyandrous um, uh, mating system of, of the jacana. So I was in Panama for about six months, um, had done a couple trips to Costa Rica. So I was definitely hooked on tropical birding. Um, and then when Eliana and I met, and actually we didn't go to Colombia until probably six years into our relationship. I think my first trip to Colombia was in 2012. But from there, I mean, you know, obviously the, the birding potential is, is huge. And um, we definitely, every time we have been to Colombia, which for me has probably been about 
eight times now. Um, we do some sightseeing, we do some family things, but we always tack on some sort of birding activities. What was actually your first lifer that you remember in that first trip in Colombia? Probably the, the Copetón, Rufus, Rufus Collard Sparrow. Copetón. Probably my first uh, one, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Mark, I thought you were going to say like the Santa Marta parakeet or something like that, you know? I thought that's what you were going to say. And you and you say Copetón, you were... <laughs> oh, but that's your first lifer. First lifer, <laughs> first lifer. I also wanted to ask you, moving away a little bit from this, I, you mentioned that you're in Florida, you're at home in Florida, and I see from sort of doing some research that you guys have, have planted in your, in your house a, a kind of native plant and butterfly garden. You've had over 100 bird species in your garden. And that's kind of interesting. I mean, we have a lot of people who watch the show who maybe don't have that much outdoor space around them, only a small area of space. What what kind of tips would you offer from your experience of creating that kind of garden to people who want to, to go down the same route? So I love that you asked that question because it's a question that I am very passionate about and, uh, and I'm gonna blame all of this on the birds because so first I got very interested in, in birding and I feel like like when you start really looking at things, you realize more and more that how everything is connected, how everything just, it's linked together and without like if we love birding so much and we love the birds so much we need to help the birds by creating habitats and what a lot of people don't realize is that you actually don't need that much space so we live in miami in the middle of this super huge city uh we have a small yard in comparison to like what maybe you are used to in colombia and uh and our yard we are now we now have 162 species of native plants <laughs> i am what? i'm a little bit organized and uh, just to say the least and i keep a spreadsheet and uh and just first <laughs> in the beginning i just started we started with just a few plants um to go back uh i think it was in 2017 we got really hit uh, badly by hurricane irma and we lost a lot of the trees and plants that we had here that now looking back, it was actually a good thing because those were all non-native. Uh, we had just recently bought this house. Uh, the plants that were here were non-native. And by us just losing all this, uh, these plants that were there, it gave us an opportunity to start with a like plain canvas, you know, like to be able to start from scratch. We got rid of everything that was non-native unless they were fruiting trees, because that's one thing that we do have. We have like a mango tree, star fruit tree, and other fruit trees. But it gave us a chance to start planting. And and like I said, you don't need that much space because one thing that you can do if you start doing your research is that you have plants that are cover, like ground cover plants. Then you have plants that are bushes, other plants that are small trees and that tall tree. So you can kind of create like a, like a layer um, of different um, plants to attract the birds. And in our small yard, we've now documented 100 species of birds. We actually just added 100 a couple of months ago. It was a downy woodpecker. Oh, cool. So it's really cool for yeah. us because it's, it's not a common bird at all down mm -hmm. here. So that was really neat. Yeah. And it's just so nice to see how the native plants are feeding the birds. So on top of us having bird feeders, we know we're giving them the best source of food by giving them the native plants you know they, they rely on like the fruits and that uh, these native plants are giving them and it's just nice to see how the wildlife starts coming back we have documented so many different species of butterflies here insects and we're like where's all this coming from it's just, it's just like it's i like how mark explains it because mark says oh it's like walking into our yard is like walking into a disney movie set because you have all the butterflies flying, the insects are everywhere, the birds are singing, and it's just a peaceful place to be. And uh, we really like showing that to, to, the, to the world because you, there's just so much that you can do with such little space and the impact that you can make for the birds. And it's a win-win situation because we get to enjoy the birds that are stopping here and spend their, their winter with us. Absolutely. No, it sounds great. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not blessed with a huge amount of space here myself in Bogota, but I have a little fruiting tree in front of my house on the street and I get some nice migrants there. I was recently at Diego's house and you have, well, I mean, you just have native forest, right? All around your place. Yeah. Yeah. Secondary, but real native. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's got endemic red, red belly grackles in his garden. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I keep my beans because there's like, you know, chachalacas and red belly grackles and stuff just around the gardens that I, 
totally love. With us, every room has a pair of binoculars. Like I have one right here, and it's like we're always like, "Mark the binoculars." What a bird! Like the, the, this morning, we're like, "There's a bird there." <laughs> and we had a, the the migration is going on right now, so we had a couple of oven oven birds in the yard. And oven birds is the it's a species that winters with us here in the yard, so it's it's really cool to see like what what's showing up. And uh, last week we had a lot of um, different species of warblers. And yeah, that's it's it's just very special to to be able to help the birds by planting natives. And it's very important to educate yourself on what plants are from your area. You know, like learn about your local plants uh, because natives is what the birds adapted to. And I don't know if Mark has something to add. I know he also loves our native yard and has put in a lot of effort <laughs> into it, dig, digging the holes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, I mean, we, we get a tremendous amount of, of personal enjoyment um, with our native planting. We've attracted, as Eliana said, so many birds and butterflies. But I think beyond you know the personal enjoyment, we've also created this little oasis of, of habitat. And, and I think the important thing is that anybody can do this pretty much anywhere in the world. If you plant native plants, if you plant um, the types of plants that provide some kind of food or some kind of cover or nesting cavities, if you if you build it, they will come um, and anybody can do this um, anywhere. So we've we've uh, we've had a lot of fun landscaping for butterflies and birds and other insects. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's something that everybody can can do, get personal enjoyment out of and also help birds and wildlife by doing so. And guys, well, I mean, it's been a great time to chat with you. Like, I, we always say to people, we could have probably chatted for hours and hours. But just to kind of finish up, I just wanted to ask you, kind of, what's the what's the future for for birding by bus? Not just on a kind of tour company level, but also on a personal level. Any plans to take her to dust off Valentina and take her on a road trip around another country? Ooh, those are, that's a great question. That's a <laughs> that's a loaded question, Chris. And you're going nah. to get me in trouble with Mark here because do, oh, do you hear Mark saying, "Oh man"? No, because I always <laughs> I'm the dreamer here of the uh. two of us, and I always have too many ideas, and uh, and I'm always con- coming up with the next brilliant idea. Yes. But I mean, I would love so Valentina. I, oh my God, I, do we have another hour to answer this question? One of the ideas is. Um, I would love to take Valentina to South America and do like a South America big year or, you know, like, you know, we're, we're already then North America big year. So now maybe doing a South America, a South America big year and, uh, and yeah, just get, get her, get her to see more of the world. And also another thing that I really want to incorporate that we kind of are working on that already is trying to do south florida birding tours but incorporating doing it with a bus maybe not necessarily valentina but i had the idea of getting a second bus so valentina is what we called a camper bus meaning that in the inside she has a little kitchen uh she'll bring all the supplies yeah like she has like the the bed and everything like that but they also sell these buses from the 70s and it's it will be a passenger bus meaning that instead of having all the camping stuff that and that valentina has in the inside it will have like rows so people can sit and we do a south Florida tour in the bus you know we ha- we're burning by bus so i mean we have to keep the bus theme going actually something really cool that we did in portugal talking about our portugal tour and getting a little bit of track i know is that we couldn't take valentina all the way over there right but one thing that we tried to do is incorporate a volkswagen bus during the tour so i coordinated i found this volkswagen uh group on facebook and uh, i was able to find someone that has a volkswagen bus in portugal and he surprised us on their welcoming dinner with his bus Aww. and we took a group picture together because so valentina couldn't make it but valentina sent her her cousin along valentina's cousin, there, yeah. <laughs> valentina's cousin made it there cousin from across so the th- pond <laughs> so that was that was really cool but uh yeah but burden by bus, at least for me, um, I know that we only want to do a maximum of six tours a year. Um, I always go on the tours. Mark usually goes on most of them. And we really like to provide the best customer service. The, we're very into the, de- the little details, going above and beyond, making things very special and trying to make a positive impact in the communities that we visit. So I want to keep these, these tours going, but always in, like making sure that the local communities are being rewarded for taking care of the environment, for taking care of the birds, for, you know, like for conservation and uh, educating people that we meet along the way. So 
And one of the tours that we do to Northern Colombia, we always bring donations and gifts for the people that we meet. So, and Diego knows this, and Chris, you too, do, you do too, because you guys both donated uh, last December, where we bought, we brought 350 pounds of clothes that people from all over social media donated, and we brought it to Colombia, and we brought it to the Waju tribe um, and donated that there plus we also made 50 goodie bags full of gifts for the kids that we meet along the way because i feel like the kids are the future and if we tell them and we show them about the birds and educate them about you know taking care of birds and enjoying the birds free and not in a cage i think that you know maybe we can teach those kids and maybe some of those kids become birders in the future you know so i i think for me it's just trying to do something positive for the people that we meet along the way. People, you know, people are the ones that are going to take care of the birds. So it's it's like a win-win for everyone. Excellent. Well, exciting stuff coming up in the future. Um, and I think, sadly, that's probably all the time that we have left. We won't keep you any longer. I know Mark's probably got a pack, right? You're <laughs> heading off tomorrow. Lots of things to do. I, I do, I do, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, brilliant. Eliana, Mark, Birding by Bus, thanks so much for joining us on The Birders Show. And as ever, guys, we'll have all the details for Eliana and Mark's projects in the description below, so you can find all the links and click there. And uh, Diego, as ever, pleasure being with you. Absolutely, absolutely. What a lovely show today with, you know, our friends from Birding by Bus. Hope to see you again, guys, soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having thanks, us. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Cheers. Diego. Thank you for everything that you guys all do. It was a pleasure. It was great fun. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Ciao. Thanks for tuning in to the latest episode of The Birder Show. And hopefully Mark and Eliana from Birding by Bus have inspired you to get out there more, do some birding, explore, maybe plant some native flowers in your garden. And if you want to keep supporting our mission to make birding more accessible to people all around the world, then please make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to be updated about all of our latest content. And also check out our Patreon account in the links below. Thanks again for watching.